Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Catheter ablation for persistent atrial fibrillation. We are all familiar with the classification for uh, atrial fibrillation, the paroxysm, less uh, than seven days, persistent AFib, the badly repeated uh, persistent AFib with a continuous AFib duration of more than seven days. But does this temporal classification really make a difference? Uh, most patients who initially present with paroxysm, uh, AFib usually will progress to chronic forms of the erasing of on, and some patients with persistent AFib will revert back to a recurrent pattern of paroxysmal AFib. The simple observation suggests that the paroxysm and the persistent AFib are not a biologically distinct identities, but rather a spectrum of the same disease. Uh, if we uh, see the study that uh, uh, followed up the clinical uh, classification of temporal atrial fibrillation, the eighth burden uh, in patients with uh, paroxysm of AFib can be really compared very similarly to the patients with persistent AFib. So the mere clinical classification of this uh, AF pattern of the persistent atrial fibrillation might not be a sufficient uh, justification to decide uh, the treatment strategy for uh, each patient in this category. It rather seems reasonable to assume that some patients with persistent AFib respond to uh, PVIs while some patients do not. The same thing with a paroxysmal AFib, some patients do respond to the PVI while uh, the rest do not. So the question here today, does ablation of persistent AFib really makes a difference? So to answer this, why and when should I ablate? I'll start with the second question. When should I ablate? The answer is early as possible because AFib begets AFib. We know that uh, as the AFib goes on, there is a process of remodeling that uh, constitutes structural, electrical, and mechanical remodeling. We'll go through this quickly. Electrical remodeling, you have uh, some changes in inward calcium channels and potassium channels, dysregulated connection functions, all lead to a reduced action potential and the effective refractory period. So patients with paroxysmal AFib has a reduced conduction velocity longer effective refractory periods and much lower voltages. Uh, the rapid atrial pacing models in animals has resulted in biatrial enlargement. We see this in humans all the time. Patients with persistent AFib have dilated left atrium. The dilated atrium and the stretched atrial muscles will lead to enhanced expression of collagen 1 and release angiotensin 2, transforming growth factor, uh, transforming growth factor beta 1, which in turn stimulates interstitial fibrosis and more dilatation of uh, the atria. Dilated atria is able to accommodate re-entrance circuits uh, with a more increase in the AF burden. Uh, and the location of the substrate uh, for the target AFib ablation shifts away from the PVI as the AFib goes on to the mass of the atria. So the first question, does it make a difference? If we consider the definition that persistent and persistent AFib really doesn't make a difference, so yes, it makes a difference. But I'll answer it statistically. Uh, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis of evidence of catheter ablation versus medical therapy uh, in over 850 patients with persistent AFib. And as we see here, the patients and patients with um, a uh, persistent nature of ablation, the freedom from atrial arrhythmia over 18 months would favor ablation, and also the they had a subpar of patients off antiarrhythmic therapy during the blanking period, and also they had a freedom of atrial fibrillation on the follow-up. Uh, patients who, uh, who did catheter ablation with persistent AFib had a um, less need for electrical cardioversion, uh, less drug uh, side effects less hospitalization, and less overall mortality. And the success of the persistent AFib ablation increases. We all know that the persistent AFib ablation has a 15 to 20 percent 
uh, less success rate during the single procedure, but with multiple procedures, the success rate can reach up to 80% or 85%. Uh, also in patients with uh, heart failure and persistent effect, do I have weight or not? Uh, the same uh, team has uh, observed that patients, so subcategory patients with heart failure and persistent effect, had a uh, increase in the overall ejection fraction, uh, incre increased six minute walking distance, and uh, more uh, quality of life. This is a, another uh, uh, systemic review and meta analysis of the PRISMA trial that uh, focused on patients with heart failure, and the pool analysis indicated that compared with medical therapy, the, the restoration of sinus rhythm held these patients to, uh, to uh, significantly improve their ejection traction. Also, there was an increase in the NEHA class, the peak VU2 and exercise capacity, increase in six minute walk test, and a decrease in the BNP as regard to the baseline. So, how do I ablate? PVI have the cornerstone for uh, AFib ablation, either paroxysmal or persistent. This is a systematic review of the European centers doing persistent AFib ablation. As you see here, more than two thirds of the center do only uh, PVI ablation and the first single procedure for patients with AFib, persistent AFib. And the success rate is over 60% uh, uh, and 40% of cases. Uh, if we compare the PVI versus the anchel ablation, you go through the posterior wall, which is uh, really incriminated in erythmogenesis and persistent AFib, and there was a slight increase in the success rate in the single and the following procedures. Do I do cafe ablations and linear ablations routinely? Uh, we're all familiar with the STAR AFib trial, uh, 2 trial. Uh, disappointing results with the cafe ablations and linear ablations. Lengthy procedure, more risk, more complications, and the less success rate than doing only a PVI in our first uh, approach. So, why uh, there was so disappointing results in the cafe and linear ablations? Is my ablation for the PVI is a proof that we still need to search for an, another target, a digital ablation strategy, or whether the ablation itself was a failure due to lack of uh, a really isolated line. In undergoing repeated ablations, uh, one study by Bavarim et al. that 80% of patients who have recurrent atrial fibrillation after uh, the first single ablation of persistent AFib, 80% had a reconnection in one or more of the pulmonary veins. And as we know, the story of the two trial uh, followed the patients with an outdated technology. We, we have another contact force. Uh, and this uh, recently published uh, multicenter trial using the contact force ablation during the PVI only showed a 10% absolute increase uh, in the success rate of a single procedure doing PVI alone using the contact force uh, catheter. The Bordeaux team from France came up with a uh, beautifully designed um, stepwise approach doing the pulmonary venous isolation. Make sure you have good lines, uh, go for SVC if you don't have a PV trigger in the left atrium, and follow up if the, your F terminates or uh, change into an intermittent atrial uh, tachycardia. If not, we go for electrogram based ablation, signs of continuous electrical activities, uh, including the base of the appendage, inferior uh, coronary sinus. Okay. Inferior coronary sinus and posterior wall. If not, then they do the linear ablation, the roof, the mitral isthmus, the cagotrichasm isthmus, and they have to make sure that they have a proper bidirectional block. Because it's, we all know that if you don't do a really good isolated line, your patient most probably will come to you with an, uh, a macro atrial tachycardia in the left uh, atrium. Uh, this is a systematic review of the clinical trial that has uh, applied the stepwise approach for persistent AFib and they had up to 88% success with a single, uh, first single ablation for the persistent AFib. Do, we, do, I have other, do I have other targets for uh, AFib ablations? You know, the rotors are defined as regional functional, re-entry is responsible for driving AFib. 
Uh, it was uh, primarily the uh, golden animal using the optical microscope, but now we're using the, the uh, non-invasive uh, multi-electrode vest or the basket catheter, and the Orion and the uh, uh, the Orion basket catheter. You can, we can really define the rotors uh, in this patient. Uh, two techniques with a focal impulse and rotor modulation uh, developed by Narayan et al. Uh, he he uh, claimed that he had a 15% increase in the absolute uh, success for persistent AFib ablation. Hissiger also reported high rates of uh, AFib termination and freedom from AF targeting the stroke or the center of the rotors uh, using the uh, uh, multi-electrode uh, vest. While the results are promising, uh, you limited studies in small and in, in, in few centers that we don't have really cl uh, solid clinical data regarding it. The characterization of the rotors is quite different between the two systems. While the the Hissiger team with the vest say that it the, the rotors themselves are migrating from one point to the other, while uh, Narayan said only the center is migrating, but the rotor is fixed. Uh, the ablation strategy is a firm approach. Uh, Hissiger do ablation in the center of the uh, rotor until the local electrogram uh, regularizes while uh, the other team has a different approach, so we don't have a standard approach for this. Uh, we all know that this car and substrate mapping and ablation has a very good uh, solid data in VT, why not in AFib? So, uh, the Marouche team has uh, defined a um, staging. Okay. So, that's a conclusion. Many patients who are clinically classified as persistent AFib will have a similar AFib pattern to other patients who are classified as paroxysmal AFib. Catheter ablation should be considered for symptom relief in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation especially after field antiretinal drug therapy. Uh, PVI is a reasonable and often sufficient uh, effective ablation strategy in patients having their first ablation. Additional ablation targets should not routinely be pursued in the first procedure. Thank you.